good morning everyone uh, let's get started with our you know uh, the april uh, the open power and power nine uh, the webinar uh, the first session is going to be given by uh, g lin from mit uh, who is actually part of uh, you know uh, you know the mit as a hands team and um, uh, g uh, uh, is going to give a uh, you know background about you know uh, you know what are the several things you know they have been working on you know with the power line system and uh, how uh, their application uh, uh, is basically uh, uh, you know advancing you know uh, the fee, uh, taking advantage of you know the power line features uh, g, uh, g thanks for you know uh, thanks for your time you know uh, for Thank this you. Uh, uh, you know the webinar today and uh, please uh, st you can start your session now uh, okay, so hi everyone. My name is Ji Lin. I'm a first year PhD at MIT. Uh, I'm advised by Professor Sung Han. So today I'm very glad here to give you a, a talk on uh, tiny inference and scalable training for efficient video recognition. Um, so I'm very happy to share some of our recent work in our group. So to begin with, I would like to give a little bit of the background for video recognition. So videos are growing explosively. Uh, uh, for every day, there is about 10 to the order of five hours of uh, videos uploaded to YouTube. So uh, such a large amount of video have been a big challenge for efficient video processing. Video processing is needed for both cloud and also edge because uh, for some like privacy sensitive areas like, like hospital, we do not want um, to share the data to the cloud for processing because there might have some privacy issues. Um, video, uh, and this is very important, especially for now like in this pandemic, uh, we need some video based understanding to help the hospital to, uh, for healthcare issues. So, uh, we are recently solving more complicated AI problems with larger data sets, especially for video, which requires more computation. And typically we use a better hardware to deal with the issue. However, nowadays more slow is slowing down. The amount of computation per unit cost is no longer increase, increasing at its historic rate. So uh, the amount of data is increasing uh, faster than more uh, the advance of the hardware. So we need the other side. We need efficient algorithm to handle with such a large amount of data. So for video understanding is different from image understanding, mainly because that we have a dimension of, we have a temporal dimension, uh, which means uh, we do not only have, uh, uh, so, we do, we, so which means we have both spatial and temporal information to handle in the video processing. Uh, scenario. Uh, so traditionally, people have uh, two ways to handle the, uh, to process the video. One way is to just like image processing, we apply a 2D CN to each of the frame. So 2D CN based method is more efficient because uh, it use uh, existing 2D CN for image recognition, and, but it cannot handle temporal modeling. Here is a, uh, here is a very simple example. Uh, there are four frames. If you follow different time orders, uh, if you follow different time arrows, you will give different predictions. So this is just the most simple case for temporal order and temporal information. On the other hand, there is an, another choice called 3D CNN, which performs joint spatial temporal feature learning. So 3D CNN can convolve along both spatial dimension and also temporal dimension. So it works well at temporal modeling, but it is also computationally expensive because you now have three dimension to do convolution. So what you want to do is to achieve 3D CNN level, level performance while only using 2D complexity. So to this end, we propose an efficient temporal modeling module called temporal shift module, also TSM. So uh, there are three small figures down here the first figure, uh, so uh, so the first figure we, we use is an original tensor without shift. So you can imagine the, the figure A is a tensor from a, a 2D neural network. 
uh, when we use 2D network to process each of the frames. There are four, uh, there are three dimensions. So the vertical dimension is the temporal dimension. Basically, we now have four frames in this tensor. And the horizontal axis is the channel dimension. So the, this activation, we have six channels. And the other dimension is the spatial dimension, which we do not use for now. So if, if you are using 2D CN to process a video, so you basically perform convolution on each of the frames independently. So basically there's no temporal information change. So you can see that each row has only one single color. So what we do is to shift part of the channels along the temporal dimension as we do in figure B. So you can see after shift, each row now has three colors, which means that um, uh, we have facilitate some kinds of temporal information exchange uh, because uh, by doing the uh, the activation shift, we can effectively effectively fuse the information from neighboring frames. Also in field B, we are doing a bi-directional shift so that we can change information from past to future and also future to past. There are also some cases where uh, we are doing online video recognition. That means we are doing performing video understanding from a streaming data. So basically we can, you can imagine we are doing re online video understanding, for example, on a, a camera or on a self-driving cars. So in this case, we do not have the information about future data. So all we do is to just shift the uh, information from past to future. So this is we, what we call a unidirectional TSM module. Uh, you must notice that uh, such kind of shifts I didn't incur any overhead uh, in terms of computation because what we do is merely to uh, change the address of the data representation. So basically we just need to uh, shift the addressed, uh, address of the data and we can perform such kind of, uh, such kind of uh, temporal information fuse. And our, mod our TSM module can be effectively fused with convolution of the next layer to uh, reduce the overhead. So this is how we use TSM module to build a uh, video understanding network that can perform spatial temporal modeling. So first is the offline version of our TSM video model. So basically, uh, given a video, we sample multiple of the frames from the video. And for each of the frames, we apply a 2D convolution like what we do in the 2D CNN. So after each 2D convolution, uh, we in insert uh, the, pro the TSM module we just mentioned and the TSM module will shift uh, these part of channels along the temporal dimension and, and after shifts each row have information from neighboring three frames so that it can be fused by the following 2D convolution. So with such kind of method we didn't incur extra computation compared to applying 2D CN to each of the frames while we can uh, perform effective spatial temporal modeling. So the uh, the second part is the online version of TSM video module. So uh, for online video understanding, each time we only take one frame as input. So what we do is to unroll the uh, process of uh, activation shift because we do we, we are not doing batch image processing. We are doing one image at a time. So for each time we so for each timestamp, we get an image from the camera and we extract feature with 2D convolution and we shift out part of the features and cache them in the memory, uh, in, in maybe like GPU memory. And for the next frame, we just replace the corresponding channels uh, with a feature from the last timestamp. So this is done in a recursive manner. So for each frame, we shift part of the channels and store in memory and replace the shifted feature with the feature from the last frame. Uh, because we only shift only a sm very small portion of the activations, for example, we only shift like one eighth of the features uh, in the activation. So uh, the, the memory we need to catch is not, not very big. So we do not, uh, we will not uh, bring like very large uh, memory access overhead. Um, so as you must notice, the 
implementation of TSM could be very simple. So here is an example code in PyTorch. You just need five lines of code to implement what we described above. Um, also, this is a, just a naive implementation involves memory copy overhead. But if we if you want to write a CUDA kernel or other kinds of kernel, it can be easily avoided. So we would like to show some experiment results. Uh, also, um, is there any questions for now, like uh, for the above uh, method description? Uh, we can have the question you know, at the end of the session now, G. Okay, sure. So uh, before we continue, we would like to introduce some of the video data sets that, is wi that are widely used in the community. So um, basically we can divide the video data sets into two kinds. So the first kind is uh, what we call less tempo related video data sets. So such kind of data sets include UCF 101, HMDB 51, and also Kinetics. Although these data sets are uh, still doing video, are still doing video recognition, so they, their data is still in the form of video. But as you can see, their labels are not very temporal related. For example, like applying eye makeup or doing some kind of sports or typing. So for this kind of classes, you can actually uh, easily uh, tell what, what the people is doing by just seeing one single frame. So such kind of data sets is not very temporal related. And the other hand, on the other hand, there are some very temporal related data sets, for example, like something, something data set or just the data sets. So for something, something data sets, it's, um, for example, the label could be stretching this ring or move something from left to right. So such kind of data sets you need to take into the consideration of temporal order, or you cannot give a reasonable like, prediction. Well, just the data sets is a hand gesture recognition data sets like the, uh, like the uh, first two videos. Uh, for example, you need to uh, use your gesture to uh, control your screen remotely. You can say swipe, zoom in, zoom out, or swiping from left to right with such kind of operations. So it's, uh, you still need temporal information to handle the recognition of gestures. Uh, as we mentioned before, TSM module can be uh, inserted into existing 2D CNN and enable temporal modeling and no computation overhead. So we inspect how we can, uh, how much we can improve over the 2D based in video recognition baseline. So here we profile six data sets. The upper three are less temporal related and the lower three are more temporal related. We use TSN, uh, which is a 2D baseline, which has a very similar name, but uh, is basically applying 2D CN to each of the image frames. So we keep everything the same. We just insert our TSN module into the 2D baseline and to facilitate the temporal information modeling. We can find that even for the less temporal related data sets, we can improve the accuracy of, we can improve the accuracy uh, uh, consistently over the 2D baseline while using exactly the same amount of computation. For the more temporal related data sets, like something, something, and gesture, we can improve the performance by double digits. We also can see that for the temporal related data sets, pure 2D CNN based method cannot achieve a reasonable performance for example, on something, something, perform, the performance is very low. Uh, this is because these data sets do have very strong temporal correlations. Uh, the, our TSM is not only uh, accurate, but also very efficient. So efficiency is, is what we want to uh, emphasize here. So here is an accuracy versus uh, computation trade-off chart for different kind of uh, models. So the orange color is our TSM module model, and the blue color is i3D model, which is uh, basically 3D convolution neural networks. So it is wi most widely used method in video understanding community, and it's basically it's the most standard one. And the green color is uh, another pr uh, previous 
state-of-the-art efficient video understanding network called ECO. So we perform experiments on something something data sets. We can find that our model consumes three times less computation than the ECO family, six times less computation than the non-local F3D family while achieving the best performance on something something data sets. So uh, during the time of paper submission and uh, publication, we are ranking the first on the something something data set leaderboard. Uh, our TSM module is not only very like efficient for the amount of computation, but it also has very high hardware efficiency. So here is an example. We, we actually profile the um, batch size and uh, actually profile the latency and throughput on and hardware. So we now profile our model on Tesla P100 GPU. So this is the latency comparison compared to I3D model, which is 3D convolution. So using batch size of one, each row represents a video. Our model runs about nine times faster, while at the same, same time achieves uh, a, a near 2% better accuracy. And we can find that uh, the uh, acceleration, uh, the actual latency, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, and also we have a throughput comparison, which means we want to gain large throughput using a GPU accelerator. So now we use batch size of 16 and our model now achieves about 20.7 larger throughput compared to 3D convolution when handling video. So uh, this kind of throughput acceleration ratio is even larger than the computation um, computation reduction ratio. We think this is because our TSM module effectively uses just 2D convolutions in, instead of 3D. So in such case, we can, uh, and since 2D convolution is better optimized, uh, our model has higher, so our model has higher hardware efficiency. And also we treat each of the frames uh, independent, uh, we treat each of the frames using 2D convolution when we effectively increase the batch size which increase parallelism on the hardware. And we also would like to show that, uh, so the, the results I previous, uh, I showed just now is uh, mostly on offline video understanding. Basically it means you have a off the shelf video, which is already recorded and you have access to every, of every frames. And now you want to uh, classify the videos or uh, re recognize the videos. So those scenarios are very, um, are usually seen for clouds, uh, for cloud, uh, for video upload like YouTube. So for YouTube, you, you have thousands of videos uploaded and you want to recognize the video for maybe rec recommendation or advertisement. So that is the case for offline video understanding. And we also show that in real life, Online video understanding could be very important because um, when, you, when you're in real life, like self-driving cars or you're, you're, you are recording videos, we need online video understanding. So here we test the online video understanding performance in these four data sets. And uh, here TSN is again, the 2D CM baseline. That is it uh, process each of the frames uh, on the go uh, using a 2D CNN. So with offline TSM module, as I just mentioned, we can gain very large uh, accuracy improvement. While we replace the online offline uh, module with our online TSM module, and again, our improvement is very consistent. And on some data sets, it even performs slightly better than the offline module. But we think basically offline and online TSM module can bring almost the same improvement in terms of, um, in terms of uh, accuracy. And we also profile the per frame latency uh, for both uh, offline, uh, for both 2DCN and also 2DCN with our online TSM module. We can see that our overhead is uh, very small while at the same time we can uh, improve the accuracy dramatically. So there's another uh, criteria when we evaluate online video recognition is called early recognition. Uh, early recognition means that how soon can you give 
uh, the classification result of a video or how soon can you give the action recognition result from a video after preserve after you see only a very small portion of the frames so uh, for example you just need to the see the uh, first 10 percent of of the videos and you can give the prediction this is very important in some scenarios for example in healthcare system uh, you need to uh, predict when the uh, man is going to uh, fall to the ground uh, so we, we don't like to uh, and give some warnings. We don't like to uh, give the such kind of warning after the man is fall. We may want to give the warning uh, when the man is uh, beginning likely to fall to the ground. So we compare this metric with uh, the ECO video understanding module, and we can see that uh, for different percent of video observation, our method is consistently better. So the advantage is very large uh, when we only observe observe 10% of the data. So uh, only when we only observe the first 10% of data, we can achieve 90% of accuracy, which is uh, enough for uh, some, where, some real life applications. Um, our TSM module is um, not only um, applicable to classification models, uh, since it's just a module with the uh, insert into 2D CM backbone, we can do it for different kinds of applications. Here we see that after insert the online TSM module into the uh, detection um, neural network, we can uh, Im improve the robustness of online video detection. So, so here is an example. So this is a car. During most of cases, uh, we can give a good result on uh, both 2D baseline RFC and also TSM. But when the car's headlights facing us, yeah, uh, we have some glares which cause the 2D baseline to give false, um, uh, like to give false positive uh, predictions. And on the other hand, with our TSM module, with the help of temporal information, we can reduce such kind of error. So for example, when the husk headlight is facing us, we get some false prediction like train, which is uh, very, so which is very, uh, wrong because we cannot see a train on a car, but with the help of temporal information, we can remove such uh, false positives. So we we evaluate the results on a image on a, uh, a detection video detection data set, which we call ImageNet VID. So the detection data sets, uh, the basic, the the most widely used two D baseline on such data set is RFCN, which is a, a single image based object detector. So we also compare to a very strong baseline called FGFA, which is a flow guided feature aggregation, which use optical flow information to fuse the information of uh, 16 frames to give the current prediction. So the problem of FGFA is that first it's not on an online, app, online, online method. So it needs the information from future frames. And secondly, it needs optical flow, which is very slow to compute. Uh, if we do not calculate, even we do not calculate the optical flow uh, generation time, it still have uh, 2.5 larger latency compared to the 2D baseline. While with our TSM module, we improve, we bring nearly no latency overhead while significantly improve the MAP, uh, which is uh, to measure the precision of object detection and we can largely improve over the uh, baseline. So our, mod our TSM module is highly scalable. We can incorporate our module into different kinds of neural network backbones. Uh, we can scale, scale down our TSM module for low latency and low power deployment. Here we profile several hardware from NVIDIA Jetson Nano to Raspberry Pi and to uh, some smartphones like Galaxy Note 8 and Pixel 1. Um, so we run our TSM module with a mobile net V2 back, backbone for uh, online video recognition on these devices. Um, we, we can see that we can achieve over 70 FPS on the GPU of a Jetson Nano, which only cost $99. And, on all, and we can achieve that 30 FPS 
on Samsung Note 8 CPU, which is enough for real-time video understanding. And on all, all these devices, we only cost about five watts, which is just the power consumption of an LED bulb. On the other hand, we can also scale up our TSM module for efficient training. So we can support large scale distributed training and we perform experiments with the Summit supercomputer. Um, so Summit supercomputer is, um, is uh, I think currently the uh, number one supercomputer in the world. So it's in Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So each of the Summit supercomputer node has uh, two IBM Power9 CPU and six NVIDIA V100 GPU and also some kind of powerful hardware. And also it has very fast network connections. Uh, however, when you want to do a, achieve a very high efficiency of distributed training, uh, scalable hardware itself is alone is not enough. And we, still, we still need scalable model design to and combine these two factors together to achieve a high throughput. So our TSM module is very hardware friendly for distributed training for three reasons. First is arithmetic efficiency because our model has fewer computation and fewer or fewer flops compared to 3D models. So we can, our model runs faster and which is also faster for training. And secondly, our model is data IO efficient. So different from a training an image understanding network, each time you just need to fetch one image for the neural network. So in such cases, uh, the data IO could be affordable if you have a strong uh, file system. But for video understanding, each time you need to fetch many frames from a video. For example, for i3D networks, you need to fetch 32 frames for video. So this is just one sample. So such kind of data IO could be a very big burden for the file system. While different from 3D network, our TSM module fetch fewer frames and we did not perform temporal side down, down sampling. So we fetch only eight frames while we uh, give a good use to all of the frames. While on the other hand, I3D model fetch 32 frames while it performs temporal down sampling all the time. The last one is networking efficiency because our TSM module have fewer parameters. So our mo model is better, our model is uh, better for uh, like all sync, uh, all reduce uh, operations. So here is some statistics when we do uh, distributed training on some civil computer. So we are able to speed up training by 200 times for two days to 40 minutes. So we profile the training time on one single submit node, which has six GPU in this about, uh, so we train an A-frame TSM module with ResNet 50 on kinetics data sets for 100 epochs. So on one submit node, we need 49 hours and 15 minutes for training. And uh, we scale up the train to 256 submit nodes. And uh, we now we can finish training in 40 minutes. And uh, the accuracy is almost the same. So you can see there's almost no accuracy degradation. And we can accelerate the, uh, we can accelerate the uh, training by 106 times. We also perform some ablation study for the distributed training scenario. So um, as pointed in some previous papers, large batch training. So we have, so in distributed training, we have, we use many GPUs to train the model. Uh, with the increase of number of GPUs, the batch size also increases. And as pointed in previous paper, a uh, large batch size could hurt the performance of models. And so you need some uh, robust model design so that the, your model don't degrade with large batch size. So we find that TS module is actually very robust to large batch size. Uh, we The accuracy does not degrade uh, until you have, so it does not degree at a batch size of 12K. So which is a very, very big uh, batch size, uh, considering that you are training on video data set and each sample has multiple multiple frames. For example, here we use eight frames for per, cent, for per video for training and 12K batch size uh, inc includes about 100K images at per batch. We also inspect the training curve. On the left side is the 
Uh, so for figure A and B, we are training on 6K and 12K curve, and we compare to training on 96 batch size, which is what we do when training on a single node. We can see that when the during the convergence, the validation loss, our uh, validation error is almost the same. While uh, we do have uh, degradation cases, we, we train on two large batch size, like 25K in image C. So the dotted line of validation error compared to single node training, uh, there are still some gap here. But we can do, uh, uh, we can get a perfect accuracy for 12K batch size. So we also provide the scalability for our TSM module. As we mentioned before, TSM module has a high hardware efficiency and is friendly for distributed training. So here everything is in log scale and um, and we provide the throughput of distributed training compared to number of GPUs. So considering the massive number of GPU used, the system actually achieves a good scalability is uh, nearly 90%. And the most communication overhead is hidden by computation. I think this is also uh, largely thanks to the uh, uh, strong hardware of Summit and also the strong networking uh, in the uh, supercomputer. And we also compare the distributed training scalability of video understanding modules. Uh, we compare our TSM module with 3D CNNs. So there are two kinds of I3D network, uh, which well, the first one used three by three by three kernels for spatial temporal convolution. And the secondly, just used three by one by one kernel for temporal modeling. So the, the green one is, uh, yeah, so the, um, yeah, this just are two kinds of 3D CN convolution neural nets. So our model can achieve 1.6 and 2.9 higher training throughput compared to previous I3D modules. And the advantage, the advantage is consistent for a different, uh, for a different number of GPUs. Um, we, what we mentioned before is about the uh, what we mentioned before is that our TSM module is highly scalable. It can be scaled down to tiny devices for edge deployment, deployment and also scale up to large, large scale distributed training. So here we, now we want, we want to discuss, uh, we want to dissect our TSM module after training to see that if it learns some kinds of uh, semantics when after training on data sets. So we dissect the TSM module uh, on something, something data sets. What we do here is to inspect what each of each channel of the, so what we want to inspect is what does the each output channel of the last convolution layer learn uh, during the training. So we find that uh, each channel in the last convolutions learns different semantics. So for example, the number five, so here we show some uh, example video clips and uh, we, we, we circle out the, the attention of each convolution channel uh, using a threshold. So basically the background is in a darker color and the foreground is, foreground is in a brighter color. So we find that channel five learns uh, a spatial temporal region that uh, it can remove something away. So for, for example, in the first video clip, we move a cup away and show the spoon behind. And this channel just effectively captures both spatial region and also temporal region uh, of the event. And same for the second and third video. And another channel captures the semantics of wiping something. So another channel learns the semantics about pushing something from Left, uh, from right to left. So here are some uh, examples of pushing cups and boxes. So again, the, our, the attention captures precisely the spatial and temporal region of the event. So um, with such claim, we can show that TSM module can actually automatically learn spatial temporal detector uh, when even when we just train a classification network using classification label. Here we again compare our TSM module to a 2D CNN, like the TSM baseline, and we expect the attention uh, of the last channel. 
so for uh, for example, for the second for the second example, I plug something into something. With our TSM module, we can do temporal reasoning, so we know that only the first several frames we have the event of plug in. However, with 2D baseline, we do not have some temporal reasoning, so you only can we do not know when the action we do not know the temporal range when the action is happening. So it's um, so it's the same for the first and the third example. In the first example, if you use a 2D baseline to process the videos, you only focus on the object. So it basically circles out all the cut box, while for the RTSM module, we know that only the first four frames were hitting the box. So it basically automatically emerges a spatial temporal object detector. And here are some demos uh, about what we can do with our online TSM module. So this is a very simple uh, hand gesture recognition uh, system uh, built with our TSM module on this JSON Nano board. So uh, it, it reads the, uh, so it fetch image from the camera and process on the fly and give prediction on what a gesture is doing here. So. Uh, due to the camera aisle overhead, the frame rate is only about 30, uh, but it's enough for real-time applications. So such kind of gesture recognition is very useful in, uh, for example, when you are driving your vehicle, you can use your gesture to tune the uh, volume of your music play, or you can um, ask the car to switch songs. So based on the gesture recognition part we can also do a very fun demo about navigation in google map so with gestures you can like uh move over the google map you can also enter screen view and exit and find different places so this is uh, the place where mit locates so we can find a place and enter street view to see the startup building where the csai lab locates so there is also another demo on the something something that I said I mentioned uh, where TSM achieves state of the art performance. So after training on offline data sets, we can also deploy the model to an online setting and it, and it works pretty well for such kind of uh, complex uh, actions. So um, this cannot be done without the modeling of temporal information. And uh, I would like to uh, give uh, thanks to our co-workers and helpers for this work. I'd like to thank my advisor, Sun Han, for, uh, for the guidance and also uh, Chuan for his, um, uh, which is my co-worker. And also I would like to thank John Kong for providing support for this work. And we'd like to thank IBM and Oak Ridge National Laboratory um, for the support of this work. And finally, uh, uh, the, there are two papers related to the work I mentioned before. The first one is the temporal shift module for efficient video understanding itself. And the second one is training kinetics in 15 minutes, uh, large scale distributed training on videos, which is a short uh, uh, tech report. So uh, the homepage of work is tsmhalab at mit.edu. And we have released our code on GitHub, uh, which also includes the gesture recognition demo. And I would like to thank you for your time for listening to the talk. Uh, I think uh, I run a little bit faster than expected. So feel free to drop any questions if you have. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Jilin, actually, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, audience, uh, uh, you know, there's a time for question and answers. Any questions? Uh, if, if you have any questions, can you raise your hands?
okay it's actually where uh, uh, you know very calm looks like uh, uh, let's uh, uh, let's again you know thank uh, the presenter g lane you know for the wonderful presentation and also running this uh, you know the wonderful application on uh, the ibm power 9 uh, the summit system which is installed in oak ridge national lab which is uh, number one you know supercomputer um Ajit, thanks for you know. Uh, thanks again, and um, I look you. forward to talk to you yeah. again. Ganesan, yeah, sure. I see I see a raised hand from Jaya Kumar. Oh, oh okay, all done. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. J, uh, can you uh, start talking now? Hello. There's a comment. He's sending the question via text, via chat. Hello. Yeah. Uh, J, uh, Mr. Jay Kumar, can you um, start talking now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, just now I got can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I have a one uh, request for you. The video data which you've taken, it is a kind of a data like car and human being and thing. Do you think uh, the temporal, you know, a shift model? model can be very useful for radar image processing also image means like a video radar video processing um so do, um, i ask him that if tsm object can be also used for lidar data or uh, is not lidar radar radar r a d a r radar tsm uh, radar data yeah. yeah yeah i think um uh so our tsm module is agnostic to the backbone like here we use 2 dcm for the backbone and i think it can also be applicable to radar data if you uh just plugging our module into the original pipeline of recognition i think that should bring some kind of performance improvement and yes my, my, i think it should be work, working because you said uh, there will be 70 uh, frames per second in that's a nano or oh, that's what uh, you know you had mentioned that correct yes some have a 70 frames per second throughput and it gives something like a 74 percent accuracy great in that radar data will not be so many frames per second it will be less for a 200 microsecond we might get a one you know one frame so that will be count to five like a 20 you know, there are a number of frames will be less there. In that case, how do you think uh, the accuracy can be increased? Um, so I personally do not have experience, experience in handling with radar data, but I think it should bring improvement uh, if you are, uh, uh, if you plug, use the TSM module uh, into your original pipeline of processing radar data. Yeah, but I cannot say for sure, but I think there should be some improvement. Yeah, that's a video data. Actually, it's a video data, which will have, a, you know, kind of color images or you know, color. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have a kind of human being and thing. The longer mm -hmm. the distance we we'll have, intensity will be very high. And the smaller mm -hmm. the place, uh, smaller the distance, range will be less, so intensity will be less. So the in and range and, the, you know, velocity, and uh, angle, these three are coming in the form of color coded form. So the video data keep coming per frame by frame. Like I know mm -hmm. moving models are quite uh, fast. So there uh, in the real time inferencing, uh, once if we train it in the uh, high end system, like what you said, work with, and the uh, car, mm -hmm. it, it will be like a jet set, nano will be that kind of inferencing engine. Correct. So uh, it will be nice if you try with the radar data with your TSM model actually. Yeah, so if your light up data is coming like a video frame by frame, that should be easily handled by our method. And our method is not restricted to human based uh, videos, like the human centric videos. Uh, that is just because I use such kind of data sets for uh, training. And okay. as I showed before, we can also do 
detection of or something, some other uh, act, uh, job, uh, some other tasks like detection of vehicles. So it also works on such kind of tasks. Super, thank you. Thank you. I'll try it out. It is in hit up. I think you have it in hit up. I'll try this one. Thank you. Okay, it's okay. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, Jean, I have a, one small question. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, my name is uh, Argya Kusum Das. Uh, so, I have one question regarding this uh, TSM model and its a mm -hmm. hardware dependency. Uh, mm -hmm. So, as you have told already that you optimized your module for this uh, Summit supercomputing system. And uh, so, can you tell me a little bit of more detail, like, uh, I mean, uh, just on the border level, like, did you do any type of optimization to take the advantage of any IBM proprietary uh, things like, let's say, this NVLink connector between uh, GPU and CPU or something like that? So did you change in the, at the framework level or in the application level? What type of optimization did you do to take the advantage of this uh, Summit hardware? Yeah, so uh, actually we are working on, so for the summit, how we actually, uh, there, the optimization is two parts. First part is that our model itself is efficient and is more friendly for distributed training. And on the other hand, we are also developing a uh, better like distributed training algorithm like that reduces the uh, overhead uh, in terms of read, in terms of latency since in summit, supercomputer, the throughput is, uh, uh, sorry, the, the bandwidth for communication is very high because we have like infinite bands, but uh, we are also doing an algorithm to reduce the latency, but that is still on the go. So it's, uh, it's a still ongoing effort. So we are, that is not included in today's talk. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, um, uh, Professor Agya, as well as uh, Dr. Jay Kumar. Uh, any more questions for G uh, Jilin? Um, I saw some QAs in the uh, QA. Yeah, um, you, can, so, you can go ahead and answer that, G. Okay. So the first one is, can we run this application on normally config laptops? Yes. So uh, the so the laptop is usually more powerful than the ninety nine dollar, like uh, so the a laptop is usually more powerful than a smartphone. So of course you can run that on this, on your laptop. So actually the Google Map demo I just saw is running on a laptop, and which soft computing model is more efficient, uh, for this applicable uh, and um. Uh, I I I think I'm not very familiar with the soft computing model, so I don't, I may not know the answer to this question. I'm sorry about that. Okay, uh, audience, uh, any more questions to Jilin? Okay, uh, once again, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jilin for his, you know, uh, time as well as, you know, the wonderful presentation about, um, uh, you know, the applica video streaming application and, um, uh, you know, running it on Summit, uh, the world, uh, you know, number one uh, the supercomputer. Thanks, Jilin. Uh, uh, and, thank uh, you. Let's, yeah, thank you. And uh, let's move. Uh, uh, let's move on to the uh, next session. Uh, uh, Clarice uh, Jilin from IBM is going to be presenting about uh, you know the IBM's uh, uh, the Power uh, Nine uh, features as well as uh, you know the uh, the, the software uh, uh, which runs on you know the Power Nine system as well as uh, the case studies. Clarice, uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Kanishan. Let me um, start, start to share my screen. Um, I'm an IT architect working for um, the client experience centers in IBM, and we do a lot of uh, prototyping um, and model development and use case evaluations for, for clients. Can you see my screen? Yes, Clarice, go ahead. Okay, great. So let's get started. Um, 
the, I'm going to focus on the systems that, that we've built that are designed to get faster time to results. Um, talk a little bit about the summit system for which you just heard a use case on and some of the um, other universities that are adopting uh, our Power9 uh, AI solutions. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail on the solutions themselves with some examples. So as you know, we've hit um, a wall in terms of uh, chip technology and, and the, uh, the limits of the design that are available there. And we're not doubling transistors um, quick enough to double performance and stay on uh, Moore's Law's path without some additional uh, efforts. So between research, uh, system design, uh, accelerators, and pulling in uh, innovative software, we, um, we need to put all these efforts in to, to stay on that path um, that, that was um, a long, long time adoption of, of Moore's Law or observation over, over the years. The other um, challenge that's, that's hitting um, the industry right now is the fact that the data is, um, is growing by leaps and bounds and not just structured, structured data, but unstructured data. So the capability of being able to manage all that data and more importantly, get insights from this data explosion is really what's driving some of these um, AI solutions. So post Moore's law, there's been some, some, some um, uh, vision of how to, how to address this through programming models. One is to uh, move the data to, to the compute um, and, and move in into memory. The other is to embed AI to add intelligence into the systems. So that's pretty much the area that I'm gonna be focusing on. Um, and that includes targeting hardware to enable data and compute placement, identifying patterns, and uh, taking shortcuts uh, based on those patterns to get to um, your end of, end of job and your get to results. And then higher abstractions of programming and uh, accessibility and democratization of these tools so that, um, so that we are more productive. Um, I'll add in that there's a lot of work going on as well on the security front, the ethics, the, um, the trusted, trusted AI and reliability, reliability, which I'm not covering in this talk um, either, but is an important part of the overall picture. So from a systems design perspective, our goal is to build um, a fast car, if you will, where you have server, network, software, and storage technologies that come together under a single um, support structure so that it's more efficient and productive for, for our clients and researchers. You heard about Summit just a little bit ago. Very large uh, supercomputer, currently number one. And the idea here is that this system is being used to, uh, to do science and to um, make strides where, where you cannot make strides without a system of that size. You've seen it just recently in the news with um, the COVID-19 um, technical work that's going on. And um, it's a combination of, of AI and classical high performance computing. And uh, you've got researchers all around the world that are using not just the summit system, but uh, a set of, um, I think over 16 or so systems that are all over two petaflops that are part of this high performance computing consortium. That, um, that the White House Office of Science and Technology policy is um, pulled together with the Department of Energy and other vendors. So just to go into a little bit deeper of what, what that means in, in a real life case in terms of you know, progressing science, this is obviously a critical need. Um, in, in, the, um, in the case of COVID-19, we're battling this pandemic with uh, data, 
HPC and AI in, in the fields of genomics, molecular simulations, medical imaging processing, natural language processing, and uh, cryo microscopy um, evaluations. So this is um, just a sample of the types of work that, um, that really are critical to us and that uh, IBM systems are, are supporting today. It's um, IBM systems going into many, many universities here. These are uh, adopters of, of our Power9 technology and doing traditional HPC as well as artificial intelligence uh, activity. You'll see a lot of uh, genomics work, as I mentioned in the previous chart, medical imaging um, is, is a very popular use case. And uh, some of these universities are also part of this consortium to, uh, to make resources accessible. So we've got um, a lot of interest in our, in our architecture that, that leverages the, um, the open power um, technology through Power9 and um, building the, the systems to, uh, to do the, the research that, um, that these universities care about from, a, from an end-to-end -end perspective. I'll also uh, plug that um, IBM itself has a very strong research organization with researchers, over 3,000 3, researchers around the world that are working um, on, on uh, these problems and, um, and working with the universities that, that have adopted the, um, the power infrastructure. So I won't go into too much detail here. You've already seen uh, some of the, the highlights of the summit system. It, this, this system has six NVIDIA uh, V100s, um, 40 core Power9 uh, processors, and these are, um, the system is 4,608 nodes with uh, InfiniBand uh, as, as a network system and um, a 250 petabyte uh, file system. Open Power's uh, role in, in this has, was significant. Um, it started with the collaboration with uh, NVIDIA and Mellanox to, uh, to build these Power 8 and then eventually Power 9 systems. And as was mentioned, I think in one of the questions, um, the uh, communication components between CPU and GPU and memory were uh, all critical in, in that system design. So we've got the um, AC922 on, uh, on the left here. That's um, a, a robust system with uh, the V100 GPUs and typically, for example, used for training in, in uh, AI workloads. And we've got IC922s, which are lighter weight and more tuned for inference engines. We've got big data. Uh, workload servers that, that handle um, large storage capacity. And then on the other side of, um, of the power systems, we've got large uh, enterprise uh, mission critical um, workloads like um, SAP HANA and uh, so on that, that are running on, on our larger scale enterprise models. So we're focusing on the big data systems and the enterprise uh, AI systems here. So you're all familiar with uh, ImageNet. Uh, this is uh, where, where we started in, in uh, 2012 is where there was a big push for deep learning and uh, because of the algorithm and the fact that there was compute power that supported these deep, um, deep layer algorithms that basically ended up with results that are better than, than the human eye as um, to, to recognize uh, images. And that use case was run in, um, on Summit and uh, achieved uh, strong scaling as, as um, was also shown in, in the, previous, um, the previous use case that uh, Jilin showed is very good scaling 
um, on on these uh, on these types of problems. Our um, power systems also bring to the table some uh, additional uh, advantages and features. One is uh, large model support, and this basically allows you to uh, process larger images or more pixels, if you will, um, in in a single passes through the GPUs and letting you be more efficient with, uh, with the GPUs. So this is a, an example with TensorFlow with large, large model support. It leverages the, uh, the communication paths and the, the potential for unified memory on, um, on these servers to, to take advantage of, of the resources um, that, that the GPU offers and keeping them um, more, more efficiently used. This is a, an example relative to a, a brain tumor. Again, uh, it's a TensorFlow large model support. And you can see on, um, on the, um, on the right-hand side, this is a NVProf image, a capture of how busy the resources are in, um, in the system while running, while training this model. And um, that bottom row is um, how busy the GPU is. And you can see it goes from um, a lot less white space to a very uh, concise um, type AC922 uh, GPU usage. So as I mentioned, our systems are, are um, built to, to work through the AI workflow starting with data and data prep, to training your models, to, um, to building um, an, uh, an inference where you're using the models in, in your applications. So these systems are, are built, built for this and um, take advantage of, um, of the Power9 architecture of the open power um, support that, that comes through that. So the AC922 is um, again a um, up, up to six GPU V100s or four GPU V100s um, to host the um, the GPU piece. It um, provides large pipes to the GPU through the NVLink and um, great memory bandwidth relative to um, to state of the art uh, x86 systems. The two new systems that, uh, that we've uh, introduced just this year are, is the IC922 for data. It, um, it allows you to have uh, up to 10 uh, PCIe slots, including Gen 4, um, so that you can have up to 24 disks um, in, a, in a 2U form factor. So it's a, a very rich uh, storage uh, system for for direct storage to um, in your rack, in your storage rack. This, the same system, this IC922, can use those, um, those slots to put in uh, accelerators, such as um, FPGAs and um, GPUs. It supports up to eight T4. Uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs and is a, a price performer so that um, you can uh, get more inference work done um, on, a, on a good platform that, that, um, that is reliable for, um, for inference type work. Finally, as part of um, our, our end-to-end -end solution, we also have Elastic storage servers. These have uh, power systems in the um, in their um, in, embedded in their um, solution. Their the storage um, the storage server piece, the control unit, and um, these systems uh, for storage are um, very scalable. They support flash flash drives, JBODs, and um, 
are are very um, flexible in terms of uh, capacity and, and performance. So there's um, multiple design points that that are relevant to uh, to our clients, and uh, all of them have um, very strong uh, performance performance proof points to to go along with them. One more uh, item relative to um, to our, our storage uh, products, we have a, a a software product called Spectrum Discover, which is a, a system to manage metadata of your storage, and this comes into play um, very often in the in the AI field, where you, um, for example, are, want to keep up with uh, image image metadata. Um, in the biomedical fields, that's also a popular um, area. So this basically lets you keep track of who, what, when, where, and why your, uh, your data is uh, coming through. And um, very useful for indexing and searching and keeps track of, um, of tags, custom, custom tags that, that you might need to set up uh, and, and um, build, build upon. So to get to our AI specific tools, we have um, uh, this um, set of uh, offerings from, uh, from the Watson machine learning family. And um, at, the, at the lowest level, we talked about the, um, the accelerated infrastructure. Those are the systems that, that I just covered and the storage solutions. Then we have um, a layer of, of management and um, processing AI workloads at scale, which include um, workload um, job, job scheduling, uh, workload optimization through hyperparameter tuning or, dis or um, distributed learning. It includes things like uh, GPU, um, elastic GPU usage, and um, a specific um, piece called the deep learning impact, which uh, provides, you know, specific model and data management tools, um, ETL options and um, vi visualization of, of your data for, for the models. This uh, Watson machine learning accelerator is very, very good for, for uh, enterprise and a multi-tenancy of, of projects as well. And, uh, popular with our, with our clients that are deploying at scale. Part of the, uh, the solution also includes Watch and Ma Machine Learning Community Edition. This is basically uh, taking the, the hard work of setting up uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch or, or your, the, your, the frameworks that, that you're using to, um, to be more efficient to get right to, to work. So it's our, our version of the frameworks that are ready to be installed on, on our systems. And underlying that is Conda, Anaconda. So these frameworks basically install with uh, just simple Conda, Conda install commands, for example. It also includes our feature specific um, solutions like large model support that I mentioned, which uh, takes advantage of, um, of unified memory as well as uh, distributed deep learning and Horvod so that you can uh, parallelize your training work across uh, multiple servers and multiple GPUs. On top, on top of this infrastructure for, um, for AI workloads, we have uh, solutions that are packaged that um, offer uh, tools for data scientists to be more productive or point and click uh, models and model training options for, for non-data scientists. So these include uh, IBM Visual Insights, uh, formerly known as Power AI Vision. This is an automatic deep learning uh, solution where you can label, train, and deploy um, through, through point and click technology on, on your server. We have uh, IBM Video Analytics which is specific to um, uh, video um, 
processing and, and management and detection and so on. And we have uh, H2O driverless AI, which is uh, from our partner H2O that offers uh, automated to machine learning for, uh, for structured data with the same concept of importing your data, defining your experiments and deploying your solution. So these, these help get to uh, a solution. On top of that, they can be used in, in, in uh, more custom applications uh, through, through our services, or for example, uh, Visual Inspector, which is a, a, a dashboard that, that leverages models from Visual Insights, which I'll go into a little bit more, more detail. So that's, that's the scenario I was just describing. This is um, for, for, for non-data scientists, if you will, but subject matter experts can build a model with visual insights that uh, predicts um, something. This is typically uh, used right now in, uh, in manufacturing use cases where you, you, you build a model to detect an anomaly or a defect. You um, download it into uh, an iPhone or iOS device through a core ML. And um, from that, from this um, device um, that you download via, to, via the App Store, um, you can uh, now have a, a dashboard and a, a way to create inspections for, for, your, um, for your defect, for example, and uh, build, and build uh, additional inspections and uh, keep track through a dashboard. So this is a, an a, um, inference application uh, built on on um, on iOS that's available for free in the App Store that you can uh, that you can download and, and try out and then uh, decide how to build based on your visual in, your custom visual insights model. So the types of of things that Visual Insights does is image classification, object detection, image segmentation, and action recognition. Um, I'll go through a, a quick example here with um, a system that I have up and running. Um, this is um, Power AI Vision or Visual Insights. I have a, a data set with x-rays that I've put into categories of normal and pneumonia. I can uh, augment these images by changing their, um, their shape, their um, adding noise, sharpening them, and so on. Every time I select a, um, a, a category, I, I add from that original set of 148 image, images. Now I could create 1,628 images, additional images. So this is um, the um, the augmentation to create more images for deep learning that that's in effect. Um, from there, I can train train the model, where I would pick in this case image classification, and get some some images. And um, basically, from there, once you've trained trained the model, you um, you'll get some. Um, some, some models that you can then deploy and um, apply for, for inferences. So in this case, if you go to uh, models that I have, um, this is a model that was pre previously created. The tool gives me advanced metrics on, uh, on the model itself. And uh, I can then deploy the model To, um, to bring in um, images that I, can, that, that I can drop and test and it'll give me um, a result. So this is AI, AI uh, vision, uh, visual insights. Once you've got a deployed model, you have this API that you can then use in your own applications or in Visual Inspector, for example, to, um, to build 
to build a, a system that, that gives you uh, inference results. So the visual inspector, um, as I mentioned, helps you from, from an iOS device, gather data to build your model, um, disk infer or disk in, or um, infer your, your results. In this case, it's a, it's a tire example of, of looking for defective uh, tires that a model was trained to find to, to identify the defect. You can manage the devices that are taking um, these images on, a, on an assembly line, for example, uh, remotely. You can um, monitor re results as they're coming in and get notifications and, and alerts based on, on issues. And um, you can save data for, for the next rev of, um, of your model, which you can uh, up upgrade um, as, as you go on with the, with, the, with the visual inspector functions. So it's pretty powerful because without being a programmer, a, um, a subject matter expert that knows what they're looking for can build a model pretty quickly on, on what, what they want to predict or what they want to uh, uh, identify. And then based on this application, have um, a, an immediate uh, structure to, uh, to generate data, to infer data, and to keep track of data through, through dashboards. Watson uh, Machine Learning Accelerator is also um, supported. Um, bare metal is the examples that I've shown you so far, but um, also part of the cloud and embraces Kubernetes and container technology with the same um, uh, in to the same architecture as, as I was showing earlier. So again, you're getting um, simplicity with um, open source uh, frameworks that, that are ready to go and work and are um, reliable. You're getting unique capabilities through the Power9 uh, architecture and the CPU to GPU communications, as well as the uh, automated machine learning and deep learning tools. You're getting um, Higher, um, higher level of uh, integration with, with your storage and uh, faster training times based on the, um, some of the unique features with uh, large, large model support and so on. And then finally, the goal here is to stay with an open AI platform and to uh, embrace our, our ecosystem partners. So I want to spend a little bit more time with one more use case on um, on how how you can leverage GPUs to get more performance, and this is both from a HPC and AI workload with um, some examples. So typically, um, to get more and more performance and to get the most out of performance, you need to go to the right hand side and be very um, meticulous with uh, going into specific uh, details of your, of your infrastructure and of your code and um, a lot of hand, hand, hand uh, work involved in, um, in building a solution that's highly tuned and, and highly performant. On the, uh, on the flip side of that, having libraries and frameworks that are already um, ready to go, make it easy to run your applications and to, um, to build on the work of, of, of others, basically. And um, the key to doing a platform um, optimized solution is to bring these um, ready-made libraries and frameworks into the realm of the type of work that really has to go into uh, highly highly specialized um, and optimized solutions. So we've got some examples of, um, of taking advantage of these built-in libraries and frameworks and to, um, to get to that level of platform optimized performance. 
And that's um, the example I want to show you is SnapML. This is a, a high performance machine learning um, a project, a product that, um, that um, is also relying on distributed capabilities. And it's doing a logistic regression, linear regression, support vector machines, tradition, basically traditional machine learning techniques, and taking advantage of distributed training across multi CPUs and multi GPUs. It's doing under the covers for you CPU, GPU memory management and uh, taking advantage of parallelization within, within the servers. And uh, we published a, an analysis of linear models that are, that are looking at these uh, machine learning frameworks. And uh, using some Kaggle data with uh, a number of data sets that you can see on the upper right hand side, we um, we ran SnapML on the Power AC922 compared to uh, Rapid's CUDA ML on the x86 system for these um, for these different data sets. And the reason we picked different data sets is because we wanted to uh, analyze the impact of um, of these frameworks on performance relative to how dense or how space, sparse the data is or how many features the data has. So fewer features versus feature rich data sets. And so with our SNAP ML library, uh, we, we found that um, when data sets do not fit into GPU memory, SNAP ML provides an advantage because of all that management that it's, that it's doing for you un under the covers. For dense data sets and a small number of features, uh, Rapid Scoot ML has the faster um, results and it may be a, a quick option for that. And then for sparse data sets, Snap ML also had an advantage in being able to manage that, that characteristic of, of the data set. So this, this uh, benchmark is available on GitHub. And there's a blog that describes more details, in particular the scikit-learn comparison that I didn't include here um, with, the, with the links below. One other um, area of acceleration for AI is um, something that, um, that we're working on called be be excuse me. <coughs> Bayesian optimization. And this, um, this basically allows basically allows um, more um, a, a more a more direct path to your to your to the wanted results you want from simulations it basically picks the next best um, simulation to um, to perform versus a brute force approach <coughs> of trying all combinations so this, this is um, a product we're working on with uh, a lot of our, our universities to, um, to get faster results through simulations using Bayesian optimization um, appliance. So it's basically applying AI to get to the next best um, high performance computing simulation. This concept of Bayesian optimization is also used widely in hyperparameter tuning algorithms where instead of doing brute force combina combinatoric hyperparameter, you can uh, apply Bayesian optimization to get to the next best combination of hyperparameters in your training, uh, training model. So to uh, conclude, I would like to point out the IBM differentiators. We're open multi-cloud by design. We've um, got um, high-level architectures I didn't go through here. Um, our approach is from an AI ladder where you organize, collect, and prep your data to uh, analyzing through models to uh, infusing through uh, inference and, and the tools that, um, that I mentioned. We're focused on AI lifecycle automation and coming, and coming to you with um, tools that are 
helpful and productive for uh, end-to-end results and across multiple teams, uh, making sure your data is, is protected and um, has the right data governance that, that you require. We've got pre-built applications, um, including uh, uh, Watson APIs and um, projects like uh, Visual Insights that I mentioned. And um, we're looking, looking at um, trusted, trusted AI and provide um, secure solutions for, for you. If you wanna work with our team, we encourage, um, encourage you to reach out to us and um, we, we do uh, discovery workshops to uh, talk about uh, use cases and, uh, and help you develop an AI plan and, and look at your AI maturity, for example. We, um, we do architectural consulting to help you leverage the most out of, um, out of the uh, infrastructure that you're, that you're considering. We also do design sprints and uh, co-creation workshops to, um, to come up with uh, MVPs, uh, prototypes, proof of concepts, and um, helping you get to, uh, to where you want with, uh, with your AI solutions. That's um, all I had. Are there um, any questions? Uh, thanks, Clarice, uh, for the uh, detailed presentation about uh, the IBM, the AI features, and also the, uh, you know, the IBM um, Powerline hardware details. And audience, uh, any questions for Clarice? You can raise your hands. So I see, I see one question in the chat about employability and where AI is taking, taking us. It's a quite a complex question. So I think probably outside of, of the scope of, of what we can say, I, I will say that there's definitely new, new jobs that are being uh, uh, created as a result of, of AI. And uh, the goal here is to make things um, more, more, more efficient, more, more, uh, more helpful to, to, the work that that's already in existence. So we see this as augmented uh, intelligence. Thanks, Clarice. Uh, any more questions, audience? Yeah. So the question is, um, how how do we create content for Open Power AI and engage students to take up real world problems? Very interesting question. I. I think at one time there was um, some interest in in the the universities that that I showed earlier that are that are engaged with us to um, to have more uh, communications between between universities to uh, to build that that kind of uh, community to um, to get folks familiar with uh, with the the work that that the different uh, researchers are doing so that's i think that's one one area is to continue to look at um some of the um some of the shared uh com communities and and um communication vehicles for, for that okay i think uh yeah i'd like to thank again you know the clarice for the you know the detailed presentation about you know the ibm ai features and the power nine capabilities Thanks, Clarice, once again, and uh, and also I'd like to thank the audience and the panelists, uh, especially uh, you know the Professor Agya from uh, Wisconsin University, who has uh, who has been supporting you know uh, for set of webinars uh, through this you know the Open Power Academy and research um, activities uh, and the group. And um, uh, thank you. And uh, we are going to have another webinar uh, next week. Uh, April 17th with uh, the Oak Ridge National Lab uh, team presenting about, you know, uh, finding a cure for the COVID-19. And that's going to be a very interesting presentation. And they are going to share the experiences, you know, actual experiences working on Summit, uh, the world, you know, the fastest supercomputer. 
uh, i hope you know uh, uh, the current audience you know will be part of that you know uh, the second webinar also uh, along with you know uh, the ibm expert talking about the machine learning and uh, the academy uh, you know how they can take advantage of it uh, with this uh, i'd like to conclude the session today and thanks for all uh, everyone you know who were you know uh, encouraging and as well as uh, uh, motivating you know to be part of you know this open power community and um, i'll see you again you know on uh, april 17th thank you